Now what do we say? Can someone okay. tell me what I have to say? Exactly. I will ask you. You will ask. I will tell you what you will have to say. <laughs> Excellent. Yay. Maybe we can do something like, sorry, like, hello, I am, and then somebody says, I am Frida, I am, oh, you say, I'm Frida, I'm yeah, working on this, I and say then I the next Frida. person, yeah, yeah, of course, and you say, hello, this is Frida, can I turn this? Okay, dear researchers, you are scientists, but you seem to have lots of fun here. <laughs> Did you have lots of fun during the project? Of course. Of course, yes. Not only, but yes. <laughs> yeah, of course. Cool. Um, before we talk about fun, tell me about your work. Um, yeah, and what what was so special to work in this area? What what did you find out randomly? Who wants to start? Men first, because you are the minority now. <laughs> <laughs> That's first. So I'm Jan. Um, I'm um, an ecologist, and I have worked uh, in the part regarding the scenario planning. So we all together have done a scenario planning with different organizations here. Um, I analyzed how under scenario, of what, the, what are the important conditions that might be important, what are, what are the important factors that might be important in the future. And we found out that it's uh, three different things that are important. One is um, the external conditions. So external drivers like political conditions um, or companies that shape the general direction of the future and this can go in different directions depending on how, um, where is the depending on where is the <laughs> <laughs> no problem it's an echo coming <laughs> so we have so we have uh, two different broad directions that it can go to. One pro, could yeah. be the pro-economy uh, policy settings and the other could be pro-environment uh, policy settings. Mm -hmm. And But it's not only these general, these outside factors that shape the future of the region, it's also the, the local factors, factors from the inside that shape the region, that shape the possible future conditions. So this is, can be biophysical, biophysical conditions um, like how suitable is it for agriculture or how suitable is it for forestry, for tourism, things like that. But on the other hand, it's also the people who make a difference for the future of the region. So how much are the people able to capitalize on op opportunities they get in the future? Um, how, did, how did you feel? Are they cap capable to, to organize and to, to, to see the value and to put it in practice? It's, it's very um, diverse. So in some places or, or some people put a lot of effort into the development of their farm or of their company or of their place, their, will, their village, and they can change how things are in that, under that particular conditions. On the other hand, there's also a lot of obstacles and a lot of things that um, stop or prevent a certain development in the region. Mm -hmm. So it's the people that make a difference. And it's also important if there's um, local organizations that can help the people to shape the future. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks a lot. I think Frida could just join, uh, uh, go on with. Yeah, I what can are take obstacles? up on this, <laughs> exactly. So I'm Frida. Um, I'm uh, analyzing more of the social system in our project, but also the interaction between people and the environment. Um, my background is on geography and European studies. And uh, my recent research was exactly on the uh, obstacles of people to rural, uh, obstacles um, to rural development within the area. Um, so what I found was that, first of all, um, the infrastructure is in a very bad shape still. Um, many villages are very much disconnected from urban centers, from, from local markets, so that those people that might want to sell their local produce, you know, they cannot reach the markets. Um, one of the main problems, of course, is rural poverty. So many, you know, farmers are very poor. Um, that is 
again, one of the reasons why the infrastructure is in a bad shape, because many people told me they don't want to have water, they don't want to have electricity, because they couldn't afford it. Um, another problem I found was um, the lack of information exchange, both between people, but also between local policymakers and people. Um, and what I analyzed as well was the um, impact of EU rural development policy on, on the area, on smallholder farming in particular. And there again, there was a lack of information. So many people just didn't know that these mechanisms exist at all. Um, they didn't know how to access certain funding mechanisms. Um, they said also that they were too poor to, um, to afford certain payments. They would have to, to pay in advance to then access certain funding mechanisms. So there, there's a lot of you know, problems related to the lack of, of money. Um, yeah, and also what, what Jan just said, um, in terms of cooperation, I think that's also a big problem in this area, that um, people simply do not exchange um, also information they have. You can ask five people within one village, and three would tell you something, and two simply wouldn't know, even though they spend their whole life in a village of 200 people. And then you just wonder what is going on, um, which is, again, a barrier to access certain EU funding schemes, because the EU often wants people to cooperate, to um, unite their fields to access certain, you know, um, funding mechanisms. Um, yeah, so that's, that's pretty much of my research. And um, so the, the key then is, I think Jan, uh, Jan said this in the beginning, that um, yeah, what we hope to contribute to is that people would just exchange, you know, more within yeah, the village, but also um, that policymakers are kind of forced to give more information to the people, to inform them better. Um, and what is definitely, you know, needed is to support local actors. So I also talked to um, some 12 people that were very active in terms of rural development in the area. Um, and they just need to be supported. So they have a lot of good ideas. They, they you know, have a lot of they have a lot of strength of how to develop the, the area, but yeah, they lack support. They lack both financial and political support. So I think that's where we, you know, we put our hopes on that these guys can connect, that they might cooperate with certain NGOs, and that we have that we can contribute to building some certain local power. Yeah. Thanks a lot. You know, how do people cooperate with? Theirs. Yeah. yeah, thank you for the question. Um, so I'm Ina, I'm also a PhD student um, in this project and I'm one of the ecologists and I've been working on uh, biodiversity, so I worked on birds and I also worked on bears and my most interesting and fascinating aspect of my PhD I think was how people and bears share the same landscape. So I, from Western Europe there's a lot of carnivores that are coming back into the landscape and there's a, a lot of opposition against them. So people don't want to have the bears, they don't want to have the wolves. And there's a lot of um, fights between like, the local people and the authorities that want to have the carnivores back. But here in this landscape in Romania, bears and humans, they have been together over centuries and people seem to cope quite well to have the bears around. So we did a lot of interviews with both shepherds and with local people and asked them about conflicts and asked them about what kind of cultural values, what kind of emotional values people have towards those bears. And generally they they quite like bears as long as the conflicts do not escalate. So if, if there is a bear that is attacking sheep and it takes one sheep, then the shepherd is okay. Like He's like, well, a bear needs to eat as well. We go to the supermarket, the bear takes one sheep. But if this bear would continue to come back and come back and take a lot of sheep, of course, then the conflict is escalating and then there should be some certain measures for this bear to be removed. And the same we found with the local people. They were quite happy to have the bears in the landscape. They found it important. They also find it important that these bears uh, continue to exist in the landscape in the future. So there is quite a lot of willingness of people to live together with bears. And I think people that live in, in countries where this, this history of sharing a landscape with large carnivores has been broken, can really learn a lot of the attitude from the people here in this region that managed to cope without a lot of financial incentives. Mm -hmm. Jacqueline, why are butterflies important at all? 
My name is Jacqueline Loos and I'm an environmental scientist and I study butterflies and plants in this area. And we, the ecological part of our research was looking at land use change and we wanted to know how changes in this still diverse and small scale farmland affect biodiversity like birds but also butterflies and plants and plants often form the basis for other animals and insects that again are part of a larger food cycle and butterflies are important in this context because they show how the environment, which state the environment is in, but also I think butterflies are an important or a good species to catch people to be interested in nature. Mm. And I found that m most people like butterflies, except from some farmers, because some butterflies eat their cabbages. But <laughs> it's, it's a good link between people and nature, and this also has a cultural value. And I learned that most people are not interested in destroying the nature at all, but of course they want to make a living. So I think we need to find a way to show people why they should maintain their environment and not make the same mistakes as we have done in Western Europe or in other countries in the world by agricultural intensification, for example. We may lose a lot of species if we use the same methods here in this still small scale farmland, for example. Do you think we are, uh, or no, why do you think we, we don't have the right to make the same mistakes than you did? I think you have the right to make the same mistake. I think you have the potential to avoid it. And this is one of the, one of the messages I would like to give to all the Romanians. Romania is so beautiful, Transylvania is a treasure within Europe and I think if we find a way how people can make a living out of this without destroying too much of the nature, then it would be a good way how people can have a, a good life but also maintain their wildlife because, and their nature. They get a lot of it back um, without even recognizing properly. It's not only fresh air and clean water but also medicinal herbs pollination services, the cultural value that I mentioned before. And I think it's worth to maintain it. And I also think that the rest of the world would be willing to help. I see that, uh, that for example, lots of Romanian farmland is high nature value farmland, for example. And there is tourism because of this high diversity. People come here to observe animals, to see bears, for example. So I, I would see this as a, as a niche market. They have something which we don't have. And I also think people value what they have, but they might not completely realize what they will lose when they use certain new agricultural measures. I was, for example, talking to one farmer who showed me on a map where he had his different parcels, and he had several different plots of parcels that were spread over the village. And he said he would like to, he would prefer to make one big field out of it all next to each other. And I said, well, that's probably very efficient and it will be very good, but you will probably lose certain bird species and certain butterfly species. And he was like, I don't even know this, like that this would happen. And if that is the case, I would actually prefer to have, to keep my small parcels. So I think it's important for the people also to get this information, like what the, what the consequences are of the land use. And just maybe adding to, to Jacqueline, so that's what, you know, what we all think that, and as I said, that um, this area is very poor in many capitals, you know, when it comes to financial capital, to infrastructural capital. But the natural capital is there and the cultural capital is there, still there. So that's definitely two, you know, very important capitals people might take up on. So that's their chance for rural development, whereas all other capitals, it would make a huge effort to do well of these, you know, so that's actually something they should really invest in and, and make benefit of. Um, and then they could even, you know, I don't know, be a role model for, for the rest of Europe. Sounds too good to be true. Yeah, absolutely. Mm? Thanks. Mm?